Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. So today it is an honor to have Dr. James Flynn on the podcast. Dr. Flynn is Professor Emeritus at the University of Otago and a recipient of the university's Gold Medal for Distinguished Career Research. In 2007, the International Society for Intelligence Research named him its Distinguished Contributor. His TED Talk on Cognitive and Moral Progress has received 2.35 million visits. His latest books include Are We Getting Smarter? What is Intelligence? How to Improve Your Mind? And most recently, Does Your Family Make You Smarter? Nature, Nurture, and Human Autonomy. Thanks for chatting with me today, Jim. Yes, that's a, that's a good list. <laughs> You've certainly done a lot into your career. Well, I try to. You know, my basic home is moral and political philosophy. And while I have written those books on psychology, I, I published quite a bit in the philosophy area. I published a book called Fate and Philosophy, which gives you my personal view, and I'm just sending to press a book entitled Homage to Political Philosophy, which is designed how to instruct students into a love of philosophy. Yes. And so, you made a joke once that you kind of vacation in psychology. So, what got you interested yes, in psychology? I became emotionally involved, particularly because of the race issue. Yes. So, when was that? When did you first start getting involved? And you left the United States, right? You had an academic post in the US and you, you left and went to New Zealand. Yes, during the McCarthy period, my politics were considered unpalatable. And I came to New Zealand where they were more normal. And that was in 63. And I've been here ever since, though I often visit the States. I was writing a book on moral philosophy in about 1978. And I wanted to include a few, a section on how to deal with those who held racist ideals. And at that time, I discovered the work of Arthur Jensen, that is, someone who was clearly not a racist, that sheer evidence showed that blacks had, on average, worse genes for IQ than whites. And I thought, oh, well, I'll look into this and expand it into a chapter. Well, of course, it expanded into a whole book, Race, IQ, and Jensen. That is, I found that his case was far more articulate and evidential than anything I had expected. And so I began to research around it and to learn and finally proposed an alternative that the gap between black and white IQ is environmental. And then, as you can imagine, Jensen fired back and I fired back, and away we went for 30 or 40 years. Well, as to how I got into psychology, yes. of course, some of Jensen's arguments in favor of a genetic gulf between black and white involve the concept of G, or the general intelligence factor. And this led me to examine it, and I found it wanting as a basis for the theory of intelligence. So much of my work over the last 40 years has been trying to clarify the theory of intelligence. There is just now an article online, which is by me for the journal Intelligence, which is entitled something like 40 Years of Reflection About Intelligence. And it tries to tell the reader what, or the listener, my main contribution. And that is an effort to clarify intelligence and also distinguish between the contributions of genes and environment. Good. Well, you've certainly contributed a lot to the field along those lines. Let's back up a second. I want you, We have a lot of listeners who uh, aren't familiar with all the technical aspects of this. So uh, let me just explain uh, just a quick minute primer here on what is G? What is general intelligence? So it's this f- statistical well, phenomenon. Oh, do you want to explain it? I could do it or you could do it. Sure, I can explain okay, it good. quite quickly. Go. There's Great. nothing alien about it. Everyone at school found that there were kids who tended to be good at all sports. That is, they weren't just better than average at cricket. They were better than average at uh, rugby. They were better than average at fives. They were better than average at most everything. 
And in other words, they weren't. There was a positive matrix. They were above average in all of these things, and we would call that athletic G. You've met people who have musical G. So you find they pick up the piano readily, and then you go on, and my heavens, they're also picking up the violin readily, and they would have musical G. Now, on an IQ test like the Wechsler, you have 10 subtests. Let's say vocabulary, uh, comprehension, arithmetic, block design. And you find that a person who tends to be better than average on one of these subtests is far more likely to be better than average on all. And G is a measure of that statistical tendency. That is, the tendency to which people who are either better or worse on a particular subtest to be better, better than worse on the lot. And that leads to the concept of G loading. You find that some of these subtests are better predictors of your overall performance than others. For example, vocabulary gives a better prediction of your overall IQ than, let's say, digits span forward, which is merely remembering numbers in the order in which they were read out. Obviously, if you had shoe tying as a, an 11th subtest, it would have a very low G loading indeed, and in that I doubt there's much correlation between how quickly you can tie your shoes and your vocabulary. Right. It's probably more correlated with Gardner's, uh, what is it, athletic intelligence? No, uh, sorry, what is it, dance intelligence? Well, that, of course, raises a whole different question. I know, I know. I mean, That's I a different can of worms. IQ tests don't include a subtest on softball. Right. And Gardner would say you could do badly on the IQ test as presently constituted, but you could still have what I guess you would call athletic G, the sort of G that I've described earlier. Sure. And you could have musical G. I mean, there's no test on the Wechsler for whether you're tone deaf or not. He has a variety of intelligence which he distinguishes from what he calls analytical intelligence. Right. But obviously, some of his so-called intelligences are part of the positive manifold, like spatial, verbal, and mathematical. Well, yes. But of course, it's interesting. While it is certainly true that to some degree, a person good at sport may be above average in analytical intelligence, it's certainly not always true. I mean, you can find fighters in the ring mm -hmm. who seem to have an instinctive knowledge of tactics and can hit very hard indeed, who are probably not particularly good on arithmetic or on vocabulary. And uh, he doesn't deny that these different intelligences have a certain correlation, but that correlation is far weaker than the correlation you have within the analytic field alone, you know, the Wechsler subtests. Right. So, regardless of that argument, G still requires explanation. Yeah, you want to find out what the hell it refers to. Exactly. Yeah, what, is, what does it mean? What is causing the rise of the positive manifold or the fact that all these things are correlated with each other? And that's really where the crux of the debate in the field lies. So, Jensen, as, right. you, as you mentioned, thought of G as an irreplaceable fuel. He thought that was the source of the positive manifold. But there's some other, like the Vander models, and there's some other developmental models arguing that G is actually an emergent property. It's not a causal force in itself, but it's something that is influenced by the co-development of multiple other capacities. I was wondering where you kind of stood on that. Well, you can say, does G have a physiological origin or a social origin? Or is it a mix of the two? Now, I would think that probably the brain has a certain optimal blood supply. And if you have more or less than that, you may be to some degree handicapped. I don't deny that some people are born with neural connections, that is, connections between neurons that are more subject to improvement by practice. You know, my practice of mathematics certainly didn't lead me on to becoming an Einstein. So you can say that the part of G has to do with these physiological factors. I take it the kid who's better than all sports may have a faster reflex arc than normal people do. Or a great distance runner 
their repulse turns, returns to normal after exercise faster than people do. So there could be general physiological portions of the brain that to some degree underlie G. But there also can be social factors. That is, when a kid who goes to school, who happens to be better at vocabulary, often makes friends with people who are superior students who happen to be better at literature. And of course, that social interaction rubs off on one another. You know, you, you have a certain genetic tendency to be superior at one subject. Why do you also show a tendency to be better at other subjects? Well, it may not be genetic at all. It may be just that being good at math throws you in with people who are in the chess club, who have bigger vocabularies than most, and so forth. So G is not a concept, to my mind, that can be analyzed purely physiologically rather than sociologically as well. Further, there's the matter of IQ gains over time, where G has no real explanatory value whatsoever, and social priorities do. Let's take something like map reading. Well, when people began to drive cars, map reading became at a greater premium in society than before. And this means that the hippocampus enlarged. It's the part of the brain that exercises when you do map reading, just as when you lift weights, your biceps get unusual development. Now, and we found, for example, that taxi cab drivers who have to know the map of London from scratch have much larger hippocampuses than bus drivers who follow a certain route. Now, of course, we're getting automatic guidance systems. So it means that map reading is less important and the size of the hippocampus should fall. So you can see social priorities have a great deal to do with whether a particular cognitive trait is emphasized and whether it's exercised or not. And this is not subject to G. That is, I suspect that map reading has a very humble G loading, but it could fluctuate quite extraordinarily as society evolves over time. And let's say mental arithmetic might not expand much at all. Today, we have calculators, don't we? And it's less important, perhaps, that we can do the mental arithmetic of the Wechsler IQ test than in the past. Her rote memory may not expand over time. My mother knew all of her relatives to the third degree and collateral and had a huge history of family lore. I don't have much need for that stuff. So while when you test an individual at a given time, you find G has some explanatory significance. You know, you find, well, at a given time, if this person is better than average on vocabulary, they're likely to be better than average on other cognitive skills. Over time, there are enormous improvements in cognitive skills, which rather than being governed by which is the most G-loaded, are governed entirely by changing social priorities. Yes, and you and Dickens have the social multiplier model. Can you please explain a little bit about that? You see, within a cohort, you are effectively in competition with other people. I experienced this in basketball. That is, at any given time within a cohort, people whose genes make them slightly taller than average and a better reflex arc stand out. And you can say, well, these physiological traits have a great deal to do with who becomes best at basketball. But when I played Catholic youth basketball, we went back and scrimmaged a team Mm. that was five years younger than we were, and they just killed us. It had nothing to do with their being taller than us. It had nothing to do with their having a better free flex arc. During those five years, American culture had made basketball glamorous. And more and more people were participating in it. And originally, it was enough to shoot and pass well. But then to be better than average, when everyone could do that, you had to learn to shoot and pass with both hands, your left hand as well. And then when everyone did that, you had to be good at fadeaway jump shots. 
So when we scrimmage these people from five years before, they weren't bigger or faster. You know, they weren't had better reflex arcs. They just had developed skills thanks to changing social priorities that left us completely in the shade. So that's what I mean by a social multiplier. You know, the individual multiplier within a cohort, yes. being slightly taller and quicker than the others, that will almost always give you an advantage. But when you compare two groups over time, you have to introduce the concept of a social multiplier. And if society is encouraging a certain skill, that skill, when it goes up, forces everyone else to run to catch up. Yeah. Now, I don't mean to put it completely competitively. Take the fact that people over time went to school more often. It wasn't a matter that you sat down and you said, oh, the kid across the street is getting an advantage I better keep my kid in school longer. It was just a matter that since everyone was sending their kid to school longer, you did too. You know, it was just natural to go with the trend. Yeah. So it wasn't so much that you were competing, but society wanting a more educated workforce was raising the average level of school. And then some parents did think, you know, now that kids are going to school for eight years, my kid had better get a high school diploma. So a competitive element could enter into it and in that people don't like to think of their children as less advantaged than other children. So as you can see, if you look at schooling within a cohort, it may be that whether your brain is better engineered has a big effect on whether you outcompete the kid next to you. You know, if you have more talent for arithmetic, You'll get into honors classes. You'll get special tutoring. So on that level, you find the individual multiplier operating. But if you look at the rise in vocabulary scores over time, it has nothing to do with the brain changing its physiology. It has to do that industrial progress wanted a more educated workforce, therefore wanted kids to stay into school longer. And staying into school longer, they develop bigger vocabularies. It's the sociological multiplier at work. Good, good. It's really great that you distinguish between the intergenerational effects and the within generation effects. That's they right. obviously you have, have different very causes. Careful to distinguish those two. Yeah, that's very good. Let me give yeah. you just a simple example. Sure. Jensen said that the years of education you got was fundamentally determined by G, you know, or by the ability of your brain to improve. Well, my father had eight years of education, and I have had, I guess, what's 22 with a PhD, and so has my brother. I do not think that we're in any way genetically superior to our father. Although he left school after eight years, he could do the New York Times crossword puzzle in ink. <laughs> which I can't do. But you see, within his generation, six years was the median. And it may be that he had better genes for IQ than most, and that putting above average. My brother and I may have better genes today, which gives us, let's say, 23 years of education. But at the difference between my father and me, to explain that by genes is ludicrous. If someone in the present generation had only eight years of education, it would be probably that they were profoundly mentally retarded. Mm. Well, for my father to be considered profoundly mentally retarded genetically, because he <laughs> was born in 1885, yeah. you know, is quite absurd. You have to see that the analogy just doesn't hold. Sure. And I like that. I think that is relevant when we think about human capacity and human autonomy within a generation as well. I mean, isn't it possible within the current generation to still be in it like an ancestral environment to like kind of by what I mean by that is to kind of like to grow up in an environment that is not cognitively enriched? Yes, it's certainly possible because people live in a certain subculture. Yes. I wrote a book once called, I think it was called... Asian IQ, you know, achievement beyond IQ, Asian intelligence. <laughs> You've written so many that. books, I don't know how you remember the titles of them all. Yes, <laughs> and 
in that book, you found that different subcultures in America had very different atmospheres in terms of intellectual achievement. That is, Jewish subculture, Chinese subculture, Irish subculture, black subculture. Many of these placed a very different emphasis on uh, cognitive and educational uh, achievement. Uh, In my Irish household, if you came home and said you made the football team, there was jubilation. Hmm. In a Jewish home, people would say, are you crazy? You may get a head injury and not qualify for medical school. Uh, You find this even today. If I go into a Chinese restaurant, I often see a kid asleep over his books, and he'll wake up and pick up the book again. Uh, You don't usually see that in an Irish restaurant. That is, you don't see that single-minded preoccupation with intellectual achievement. And uh, you... My father would have said, well, you know, okay, the Chinese score higher on an IQ test than we do, and they get more jobs, but who the hell wants to live like that? I would rather do reasonably well at school and argue politics at the pub. And I do take satisfaction when my kids make the football team. So you find cultural differences between groups that are very profoundly related to pressure within that group for intellectual and academic achievement. Now, let me tell you a story. Jensen said that one of the things that did blacks, showed that blacks were probably genetically inferior for IQ, is that black-white differences became wider as you went up the G-loading ladder. You remember that rote memory has a very low G-loading. And their black-white differences were relatively minor. And then you get up to vocabulary with a very high G-loading, and whites outperform blacks by a far greater degree. And he said, since G is physiologically influenced, that is pretty good evidence that there's a physiological difference between black and white for intelligence. Now, I was the first to look at IFOS data from Germany where black and white children, not the first to look at the data, but the first to look at it from this point of view. When you had black and white occupation troops in Germany, they tested the offspring that they had with German women, and that they found that having a black father seemed to be no real handicap as compared to a white father. And there was great attention on that, but the samples are not really big enough, and you can't draw strong inference. And one of the things I thought of was, what's happened to G here? And when you look at the profile of these half-black and all-white kids on the Wechsler, you found there was no G pattern at all. That is, that in point of fact, whatever differences there were between the two didn't correlate with G. If there was a slight advantage for blacks, it could be on vocabulary. If there was a slight advantage for whites, it could be on rote memory, Hmm. and the tar correlation was zero. Now, what was different here? What was different here was that these half-black kids raised in Germany were not being raised in a black subculture. They were just being raised by random German women spread throughout Germany with no black subculture at all. So when blacks lived in Germany without black subculture, There was no pattern of negative correlation with G. And then I read Elsie Moore's study, and she got kids, all of whom were black, and half of them were adopted by white professional parents, and half were adopted by black professional parents, where the mothers had 16 years of education. When she tested them at the age of eight and a half, the black kids adopted by whites were 13 points ahead of the black kids adopted by black professionals. And then she had these mothers come in for interview, and she found that the white mothers were universally encouraging. When they encountered a problem with their kid, they would say, that's a good idea. Why don't you try that? All smiles. The black mothers were universally censorious. You're not that dumb. You know better than that. In other words, there were subtle differences between the black and white subculture that influenced 
kids' abilities at problem solving that had nothing to do with black and white genes. They had to do with the different kinds of preschool experience of kids in the black and white subcultures. And if I follow this up throughout the age of 24, and I've tried to show that at every stage, white subculture places much more emphasis on complex problem solving than black subculture. So I don't know which is more uh, controversial if you said it was 100% genetic or you say 100% environmental. You know, it's like... You mean between black and white? Yeah, between black and white. I don't know if there... What is there any resolution Uh, to this that that isn't controversial? empirical evidence. Sure. And that the present IQ gap, there is enormous evidence that much of that gap is environmental. Now, we'll only know whether all of it is eventually, but I did a study with Bill Dickens where between 1972 and 2002, blacks made up five of the 15 points and are only 10 points behind whites. And this showed itself in academic achievement scores on the nation's report card. They made the same gains there. Now, I think you'd have to be mad to think that even today, the black and white environment for cognition is equivalent. Sure. So let's say they make up another five points over the generation. Well, that cuts it to five, doesn't it? So now we're getting down to the point where, you know, twins and singletons have a four-point difference between their IQ, and no one runs around the streets killing each other over that. I mean, if it's blacks get to the point where they're only two or three points behind whites, it may be because even then, white culture is more like the Chinese and black culture is more like the Irish. So I'm not going to say I know for certain the gap is environmental, but I do know for certain that the present gap is not entirely explained by genes. And I have a lot of evidence that seems to indicate that the differences are really subcultural in origin. The question between black and white is an evidential one, but no one wants to say that. They want to say the sky would fall if there was a slight genetic component. Therefore, we must classify this as non-scientific. And therefore, we must attack everyone who investigates it. Right, which wouldn't be the case. I mean, nothing would justify racism. So let me ask you a question. You seem to be fairly confident that the uh, environment, the main core environmental factor are child-rearing practices. Have you considered the extent of variance explained by other environmental factors, such as, I don't know, like the effects of having a lot of mortality salience around you, you know, violence, just like oh, poor well, schooling, that's a whole different question. poor ability, like buildings that are, you know, like it's hard to have uh, to score well on cognitive tests when you're being distracted by life concerns and survival, right? Yes. Yeah, so if, if a black kid is living in a solo parent home and there are a series of lovers who are violent, there was a case in New Zealand when a skeptic about whether poverty environments were bad for kids went into a home and as soon as the child saw this visitor, he crawled under a couch. That was the mere appearance of a male was a threat. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, I'm I'm not discounting that in the preschool environment in black homes, there is on average something that may be equally as important as less intellectual challenge. Right. So then prejudice enters in. I don't know if you noticed my statistic that in New York City alone, no undercover cop has ever been shot by another cop. Since 1942, as I recall, something like at least 30 black undercover policemen have been shot by a white cop. And that's because you see a black with a gun, the stereotype is that he must be a criminal. (laughs) And you have these terrible situations where blacks who go undercover as policemen are the prey of whites, and the whites are are conscience-stricken. They don't want to shoot their black comrades. That you see with a black with a gun, you think of a criminal. When you see a white with a gun, you think he may have some legitimate reason for it. So there are, there are a whole range of factors that enter in to the plight of black males in America. On average. 
Yeah. So these are really important to have these open, honest conversations as about all the potential causal factors. I mean, if we really want to help blacks, the only approach is a scientific study of their situation. Right. I mean, how are people to know what afflicts blacks if they don't use science? Are they going to conduct horoscopes? Right. And if you make this a forbidden area for scientific inquiry, well, then we've got our arm tied behind our back. I agree with that. I agree that we need a uh, open, honest conversation of all the causal factors, all the potential causal factors. But in terms of what the realistic data tells us about the races, it seems to indicate that racial differences in terms of genes would be quite small. And we'd do better to get on with building a better society for everybody and treating each kid as an individual. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more, what you just said. And, you know, here's a quote that you, uh, from your book, your latest book, I thought was very interesting because this stuff tends to get political. And I, that's why I really liked you kind of transcending the politics for a second. You said, quote, to suffer as a child in an impoverished home is an evil in itself, no matter what the eventual effects on intelligence. Right and left differ only as to means, that is, how to strike a balance between the welfare state and the free market as a cure. I thought that really nailed these contentious divide, the political divide, but also transcends it in a way because it makes it clear that what we all care about as a fundamental humanity is, you know, right. right, right. And so I thought that was a really, really wonderful I mean, uh, there's quote. no evidence, no evidence at all that some major racial group in the world today is so tainted by genes that they can't participate fully in the rich life of a good culture. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, the fundamental question is settled. No one because of race, because of the frequency of racial genes. I mean, everyone is an individual. The best genes right. in America for IQ could be a black male. But statistically, if there are differences, they're quite minor. And the fundamental thing was the one posed by Plato. He thought, unfortunately, that certain barbarian groups didn't possess the genetic quality that they could be educated enough to be integrated into Greek society. Well, he was wrong. Every racial group has sufficient cognitive potential, and the potential is so overlapping that none of them would be excluded statistically from participation in a rich society because of their race. Right. I'm glad you made that point. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, do you think Charles Murray has been unfairly criticized and maligned? Oh, definitely. I mean, it was shocking. I've written a book, by the way, about the decline of free speech in American universities that I'm now talking about for a publisher. And uh, that Murray was not allowed to speak at Middlebury was just absurd. Uh, in my book, I point out all of the insights I would have lost if I hadn't argued with Charles Murray over the years. I mean, even if you don't agree with a position, if it's intelligent and evidentially based, you learn an enormous amount from trying to see the extent to which it's true. And Charles Murray, along with Jensen, and along with Richard Lynn, have been the people who have educated me the most in psychology. Murray is a certainly without racial bias. He certainly is someone without gender bias. I happen to know him personally. And uh, he wants to, of course, follow the evidence. And when he makes a point, you can bet your bottom dollar he has evidential support for it, and it's worth taking into account. And you may only half agree with him, but you'll learn a hell of a lot from arguing with him. The most important part of the bell curve is not what it says about race, and it's very guarded about race. The most important thing in the bell curve is the meritocracy thesis, the view that we liberal lefties self-destruct. You know, we try to eliminate environmental differences and privilege, and that means that all talent differences will now be genetic. And in an open society, you'll have all the talent for genes going to the top, and the bottom will become a sort of genetic dump. And that rather than working towards a society we on the liberal left would admire, 
we're working towards a society that will be a horrible gene caste based meritocracy. Now, that's a thesis that's far more worthy of refutation than anything else in the book. And I've tried to do that in several of my books. If you're interested in the one that would probably be the best, it's my little book, Fate and Philosophy, in which I have a section on the meritocracy thesis. And virtually every reviewer put that in the too hard basket. That is, they didn't want to confront this devastating critique of liberal ideals and practice. And that's actually one of the things most worth yeah. <laughs> trying to answer in the book. I mean, yes, that's a fascinating question. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Is there any way you can summarize that section in two minutes? Well, very quickly, I think that rather than a tendency towards that type of society, with affluence and a humane society, you find that people play to their own strength in terms of personal development. That is, you don't find that every talented person is trying to get to the upper class in terms of prestige and wealth. You find that when we're not threatened by poverty, a person who would prefer to be a poet becomes a poet. And a person who would prefer to spend 30 hours a week training for the marathon does that. And a person who would prefer to be a philosopher finds they won't starve as a philosopher rather than, you know, becoming a corporate lawyer. So I think when you look at the dynamics of modern society, you find, assuming that it has humane values, actually social progress and affluence means that people fly off in a hundred different directions in terms of talent. And there's no single hierarchy of wealth and status that claims all of talent for itself. So that would be a very brief answer. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for over the past three and a half years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, It'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read and appreciate all of the reviews. Another thing you can do is donate some money to the show by going to thepsychologypodcast.com and clicking on the link Support the Podcast at the bottom of the page. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Thanks to the donations we've received so far, we've been able to increase the audio quality substantially. So your donations really do go to helping to make the show a better listening experience. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. You know, I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity. Okay, now back to the show. So, you know, what I found really interesting about your book, your latest book, is you bring up a point that is not raised often enough, and that is that nature and nurture aren't the only two options on the table here. You know, you say autonomy actually comes at this like 20% unexplained sort of variance or this exactly. chance, this chance level. And I think it's really interesting because people seem to want to place autonomy either within, so they'll say if something is 100% environmentally determined, a lot of people, uh, you know, will think, oh, that means that we have autonomy, you know. That's right. But that doesn't mean that, right? Of course it does. I mean, imagine that you live in the best home in America. You could be accidentally dropped on your head as a kid, you know. And that would mean that due to an accident, your genes and your environment would not be totally explanatory of your eventual IQ. An accident of life history would be important, wouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. And it may be that you're zooming along towards medical school and Vietnam comes along and you're drafted to an environment which for three years is a very unpromising environment indeed and sets back your intellectual and development. Now, every psychologist will admit that the factors of genes and environment have to be qualified by life history, and that that type of good or bad luck in life history means 20% of IQ variance, which is a lot. Yeah. Now, just as someone could be drafted out of medical school, in a fate of patriotism, they could volunteer to go in the army, you know, and be a foot soldier. Well, that would be an act of autonomy, wouldn't it? 
And it's not distinguishable from bad luck. The fact that that amount of IQ variance exists as a symptom of life history means that a lot of those people have made free choices that either benefit them or hurt them. I, at one time, had a bout with chronic anxiety, and I chose to take Aeropax, which relieved it. And that meant that I returned to an environment that matched my genes. A Christian scientist would perhaps not have taken it, would have made a voluntary choice, and would have not taken the medication. So voluntary choice had everything to do, even in a situation where genes and environment seem fully explanatory. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I created a correlation between genes and environment through my voluntary choice. Mm-hmm. But uh, certainly the existence of that 20% of IQ variant shows there are a lot of people in the world who have made choices that have lifted them into an environment above their quality of genes or sunk them into an environment below their quality of genes. It isn't an index of, it's an index that we know that autonomy is important. It doesn't, however, show the degree of autonomy. Because through autonomous choices, you could actually make your genes and environment correlate, as when I took that medication. Yep. And is this, does this relate to your distinction between external and internal environments? Yes, there is, a, of course, a big difference. When my brother went into the Army during World War II, he probably suffered less from the environment the Army gave him. He was a, a chemist. And, went into chemical warfare, and since there wasn't any chemical warfare, they didn't know what the hell to do with them. So they sprayed all these chemists with mustard gas (laughs) to see how they would react to it. And you can say this was a brutish environment, but my brother had learned to play chess. And while he was in the army, rather than just being exposed to sergeants screaming at him, he found a guy and they played chess together. In other words, he carried with him into the army, a set of traits that helped mitigate its deleterious influence on his intelligence. My Uncle Ed, who went into factory work at 11 during World War I, got a reputation for being peculiar because when he was on ship, he would read books by torchlight. (laughs) He had learned, you know, to love reading. And so he created an external environment thanks to his own internal environment. Yeah. So when you look at environment, uh, there's an interplay between external and internal. Hmm. A certain sort of person who has developed excellent traits, like exercising their mind, will go into an environment which, for all purposes, appears to be the same as another person's external environment, but they will resist its deleterious influences. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people really are aware of or make that distinction between the internal and external environments. So I think that's really good. So in addition to having, you can have a very rich internal environment and still have what you refer to as a family handicap, right? You can still live in your own mind to some degree, even in a bad environment. Hmm. And you can be in what seems superficially like a good environment, and yet somehow be resistant to every good thing it would do to you. Yeah. And you calculated a very interesting calculation of the real world implications of having a family handicap on SAT scores. So you said if the typical person who scores 115 happens to come from a home equivalent to their genetic promise, they would have scored 118. But if they had the bad luck to come from a home at the 12th percentile of cognitive quality, they would have scored only 109 or nine points less. And you convert nine points to that's a 66 point SAT difference. Yes, I tried to calculate. I tried to show that what we're told by people that by 17, environment has faded away by an influence that you're entirely controlled by your genes. Well, by 17, your vocabulary is enormously important in terms of doing well on the SAT verbal. And universities use the SAT verbal to see which their students are at risk. And even at 17, your vocabulary, there is sufficient family environment still lingering to determine very importantly what university you're eligible for. Mm. 
So there's very clear implications here of of environment on your opportunities for getting up, passing uh, right. to the next I, I stage. I do want to yeah. emphasize that a person who suffers from an impoverished environment, of course, deserves help for that reason alone, setting aside whether they get into Georgia Tech or Harvard. But yeah. It's still interesting right. that, that it can have an influence. Yeah. And uh, we made that point earlier as well. So you have done an analysis of the different cognibility profiles that show the most persistent family effects and which show the least persistent family yes, effects. Yes, that's right. For example, arithmetic, the influence, the preschool influence of your family fades out very quickly, while with vocabulary, it lingers on and on. Right. So why vocabulary? Well, because unless you're completely alienated, you do sit at the dinner table and still talk to your parents. and. You talk to their friends, and while the family loses out to your peer group to a large degree, you know, you do start to surround yourself with peers and adapt your vocabulary to theirs, there is at least some continuity, at least into the early 20s, when you've left home completely, of family influences on vocabulary. The arithmetic situation is almost entirely as to whether your folks have taught you arithmetic before you go to school or not. Mm. And that is almost completely overwhelmed by arithmetic classes, where everyone learns arithmetic, and the kids that are brighter learn more of it than the kids that are less bright. So if you look down the different cognitive skills, I thought oh, the, the only review I've seen of my book was sharply critical. And I thought, for heaven's sake, <laughs> there are a lot of things in the methodology of that book that I didn't know. Don't other people want to know them? Yeah. I look at all of the mental skills on the Wechsler tests and on Ravens, and I try to discern, and I think I do discern, that at what age does current environment take over from the previous environments like family? And of course, current environment has the toughest time submerging family for vocabulary. It has its easiest time for mental arithmetic. And I try to give reasons for all the different cognitive traits as to why some of them family influence fades away earlier or later than others. Yeah, you did a heck of a job with that. And your uh, age table method is really impressive. Well, I hope so. You know, people keep saying, do I give a sufficient theoretical justification of it. Well, I don't know. I try. But let's imagine that I couldn't give a theoretical justification. The mere fact that it mimics the results of the twin studies shows that it's terribly useful when you have data where twin data is absent. You know, you can actually go to the manuals and you can see in that particular country at that time what the effects of family and current environment are on a mental skill. Now, it might be a lot better to have twin data, but you know, twin studies have only been done in a relatively few countries. Sure. Uh, I'm not arguing that we should replace twin data. I'm saying we should supplement it. Yes, absolutely. And one interesting finding that you did using this new age table method is the effects of adoption are very little after the age of, let's say, 20, right? Yes, even vocabulary after the early 20s, residual family environment becomes fairly minor, and you get a good matching between genes and environment. But always remember that 20% where the match doesn't occur. Right. Autonomy. Yeah, that's, yep. that's where the autonomy... Well, autonomy plus bad luck. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so chances, yeah. Um, and we can't partition that. It would be uh. interesting to have some studies see how much of it is bad luck and how much of it is choice. I, you know, I wrote this uh, article for Scientific American recently summarizing this toy model that these physicists came up with showing just how prevalent the effects of chance have when they compound, you know, in the rich get richer, yep. poor get poorer sort of way. So, I think we would have to kind of model it in that sort of dynamic way, right? Yes. So, what can we learn from astronomy about human intelligence? Oh, well, from astronomy, we learn something that is relevant to the theory of intelligence. Some people say, why can't we give a definition of intelligence which is so precise that we can measure it? Well, that's not the role of intelligence, and the same thing is shown in astronomy. I mean, in astronomy, 
you have concepts that you want to be fairly broad. For example, gravity was a fairly broad concept. It didn't, the concept of gravity, that, that let's say gravity's main concept is that the motions of a planet are influenced by other big heavenly bodies in your vicinity. Now, you can always say, why can't we have a concept of a gravity that tells us just how to measure the motions of the planets? Well, you don't want that. What you want is a concept that focuses your research on planets and their location to one another. And you want it left open to scientific inquiry to see exactly how those variables influence planets. For example, Newton came up with the correct theory that you find that heavenly bodies influence one another in proportion to their mass and negatively in terms of the distance squared. Descartes thought that the reason that the sun influenced the earth was that it created a whirlpool in the ether. And the planets closest to the sun were whirled around faster than the planets further away from the sun. Well, he proved to be wrong. But what you wanted was a concept of gravity that gave empirical scientists sufficient elbow room to jump in with conflicting hypotheses. And I say the same thing about intelligence. Hmm. You don't want a concept of intelligence that dictates theory as to how variables affect intelligence. You want a concept of intelligence that gives broad advice and say, well, this is the battleground on which theories should, you know, fly with one another. But we all work within the advice given by that concept of intelligence, which is specific enough to direct our research, but broad enough to allow for differing results from our research. Mm, I like that. So you put forward this meta theory. Yes, I tried the second half of the book to give, as well as I can, the theory of intelligence that's emerged from my work over these 40 years. I like that. And I like how you go through all these different theories and, of intelligence and kind of see how they, and you, you show they are consistent with the meta theory, which is neat. I try to. Yeah. And I want to ask you, you know, we talked about Howard Garner's theory earlier uh, at the very beginning of this show. There was one point you sure. made in that section that I really liked. I so I just want to I want to bring it out, bring out that point. Now you made the point that your major beef is with the hierarchy of values that we have in our society of what abilities right. are important. And in that way, you agree with Gardner. I agree with Gardner. We can actually disagree with Gardner's you know statistical analysis or the fact that they are completely independent, which modern research shows they are not completely independent. But regardless of that point. I think there's a really important point to be made there, which is, you know, our schooling, a lot of our structures to climb that ladder rely so, are so heavily G-loaded in a sense, right? Yep. And yeah. as I say, I want, just like Gardner does, I've never met Gardner, but I've corresponded and seen his stuff. And both of us want a society in which people who lack the entrepreneurial virtues and have other virtues have a better access to a good life. I mean, it's terrible how the present economic trend is separating off people with so-called entrepreneurial virtues into an elite that leave the rest of society behind in terms of access to life to an extraordinary degree. It would be much better if we had a recognition that human beings are more than working machines that they have a life outside of work. You know, it would be much better that rather than just emphasizing what pays in terms of the market, we encourage people in a humane way to have access to as good a life as possible. For example, there are plenty of people I know who love working with wood and working with their hands. Now, there's no reason why the state shouldn't provide workshops where they can go and exercise that skill that are relatively free. There's no reason why we shouldn't subsidize sport on the amateur level or theater, where people who have intelligences, as Gardner calls them, different from analytical intelligences, have a much richer life. So he and I, I think, have the same image of the common good. 
That's one Aristotle proclaimed. He said, you have a good society when there's a rich and rewarding way of life, and as many people have access to its benefits as possible. And we, by merely allowing the market to label what's socially valuable, we condemn many people not to have as rich a life as they could, given their non-entrepreneurial talents. Jim, my mentor, Nick McIntosh, a year before he died, he was at the ISIR conference. Lubinsky was interviewing him and said, who do you think is the most influential, important intelligence researcher in the field? And he mentioned James Flynn, and I can see why. So thank you so much for bringing your insight, wit, humanity, moral philosophy, and just who you are to the table. Thank you so much for this chat today. Well, I'm very happy to appear and talk to you. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.